Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Hey, it's good to see everybody in. My goodness, we've got, uh, I think, every chair filled, and we've got a lot of out-of-state listeners today. We've got two up here from Florida. We've got six back there from Pennsylvania, and uh, we've got several other new ones from our area, so we want to welcome every one of you. And, uh, of course, if you don't want to be on the television camera, why, well, you've got to let the guys know, otherwise they're going to seek you out, and uh, they're going to give you a, a, a shot sooner or later through the afternoon. But anyhow, we're glad you're here, and for those of you joining us on television, again, we're just going to uh, open the Scriptures and hopefully clarify a lot of questions because I can tell from the mail and the phone calls that some of the things we teach are just absolutely new to so many people, and yet it's not new. It's been in here for thousands of years. The only thing is they just can't see it. But we're going to do our best to uh, keep opening the Scriptures, not what I think or what any denomination thinks, but what does the book say? All right, now for just a little refreshing of our memory, I'm going to look at a couple of the verses we closed with in our last program, which on television, of course, was just yesterday, but for those of us in here, it's been two weeks ago. But turn back with me to Luke chapter 1, and we've been looking at this whole concept now of connecting the dots, drawing the big picture from Genesis to Revelation, and the biggest share of it, of course, starts in Genesis chapter 12, and the call of Abraham, and the appearance of the nation of Israel. The first 11 chapters are just what I call a disaster, and uh, it's, it's pitiful how everything went down, down, down from the time of creation until God called out Abraham. Well, we came up through the Old Testament then in our last eight programs showing the person of the coming king and uh, how he had been prophesied all the way up through the Old Testament. And now today we're going to look at the physical aspects of the kingdom over which this king will one day rule. And uh, so just to pick up a little, like I said, a mind refresher from our last program, turn back with me where we stopped in Luke chapter 1, where Zacharias the priest has now had this outpouring of information from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's not just like I always say, the wishful thinking of a good Jew, but rather this was the very mind of God. All right, I'm going to drop in at verse 71. This is just part of is speaking forth of what was about to happen so far as Old Testament prophecies were concerned, and that is that the Messiah was now in their midst. John the Baptist will soon start announcing it. But here Zacharias, at the birth of John the Baptist, is letting Israel know what is about to happen. All right, now I said 71, maybe I should go back as far as 70. The servant David in verse 69. See, I can't help it. I go backwards. <laughs> we just get to keep going back. All right, in 69, it's his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets now in verse 70, who have been since the age of the world began. Now, this is what the prophets have been writing, remember, that we, the nation of Israel, all of this is Jewish. There's nothing in here for Gentile. That we should be saved from our enemies. And I always make the point. Now, they're not talking about sin yet. We're talking about their mortal enemies living all around them, even as they are today. That's why it's so appropriate that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember His holy covenant, the oath or the covenant which He swore to our father Abraham, and that He, God, would grant unto us, Israel, that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve Him, serve God, without fear, in holiness and righteousness before Him all the days of our life. And thou, child, speaking of John the Baptist, who has just been born, thou, child, shalt be called the prophet or the foreteller of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare His ways to give knowledge of salvation. See, now we're dealing with the sin problem to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of 
their sins to the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. All right, now that's where we stop. And uh, I'm going to go back now and pick up the other side of the prophecies, and that is the kingdom itself and all of its physical properties. Now we're going to take you all the way back to where we've been many, many times over the last many, many years, to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Now remember what we're talking about. The last eight programs were the promises concerning this person, the Messiah, who would be the king over this glorious earthly kingdom. Now I'm going to go back and start from Exodus and bring along all the prophecies concerning the physical attributes of the kingdom. Now, before we go any further, before I have the guys turn the board, I'm just suddenly reminded, because of all the questions we get, showing the confusion in all denominations about this earthly kingdom, People can't get it through their head. Yeah, I've got heads nodding. You've run across it. They can't get it through their head that when time ends, as we understand it, and the tribulation has run its course, and the earth, of course, has been devastated by God's judging the iniquity of mankind, and the earth is going to be totally renovated, regenerated, and reconstituted. Now, those were the words that are used in Scripture. And it'll be an earth like the Garden of Eden, and that will bring in the thousand-year earthly kingdom. And they can't, they can't get it through their head. Well, then I'm just suddenly brought to mind when my youngest son, Todd, went up to Southern Illinois University. That was back in the late 80s, wasn't it, honey? And the first day he were, the first Sunday he was up there in, uh, in Carbondale, he found a church and he went to a Sunday school class of college kids. He was up there working on his master's. And the subject in that Sunday school that morning was the kingdom of heaven. And all they could talk about was the invisible spiritual aspect of that kingdom of heaven. And he said after about 20 minutes he just couldn't hold it any longer and he interrupted and he said, no, wait a minute. You've got it all wrong. This isn't an invisible kingdom. It's a visible, veritable kingdom over which Christ is going to rule and reign as king. And now how I picked it up, we came in the house from church and the phone was ringing and Todd was on the phone, all shook up because of what he had just experienced at his Sunday school in church. And I mean, he was shook up, wasn't he, honey? Almost, uh, he probably wouldn't want me to say this, but almost in tears, because when he pointed out their error, that this isn't something invisible and spiritual, it's a physical, visible kingdom. And he said, Dad, what do you suppose they, they almost screamed at me? And I said, tell me. You mean it's a political thing? <laughs> and he said, well, if you want to call it that, yes, but it's going to be a kingdom over which Christ is going to rule and reign. He said, they couldn't get it. And they just scoffed and scorned him. And he says, I'll never go back. Well, I, said, I don't blame you. I wouldn't either. But see, that's the mentality of Christendom. Because Todd wouldn't go to some offbeat liberal church. He went to what he thought was rather biblical. But see, they have no concept of this earthly, glorious 1,000-year kingdom over which Christ is going to rule and reign. But it's through all of Scripture, as I'm going to show you today, continuing on from the last eight programs. All right, so now the first real mention of this kingdom is in Exodus 19. So turn with me to Exodus 19, and we're going to jump in at verse 3. And then we're just going to do a lot of Bible reading today. So those of you out in television, bear with me. We're, we're just going to let the Scripture speak for itself. I don't have to comment on it. It's so plain. The language is so evident that we can just let it speak. All right, Exodus chapter 19. We're going to start at verse 3. And Moses went up unto God up there at Mount Sinai, I remember, and they're all gathered around the mountain. They've just escaped from the Red Sea experience. Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, 
You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, which he's going to give now in chapter 20, the covenant of law, the Ten Commandments, and all the rest of it. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you, now we're talking about the nation of Israel again, you shall be a treasure unto me above all people. They're going to be the chosen race. And God says, I can do this because I'm sovereign. All the earth is mine. And now here it comes. Verse 6. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Now, way back, I haven't done it for a long time. Way back, I said, the kingdom is the kingdom is the kingdom is the kingdom. What kingdom is it talking about? That thousand-year reign of Christ, where the world is going to be totally under his dominion. It's going to be heaven on earth, and that's why it's called the kingdom of heaven. It's going to be completely void of sin and death and disease and all the things concerning the curse, because the curse will be lifted. Satan is removed. He's locked up in the abyss. And so it's going to be heaven on earth. So keep that locked in your computer that we're talking not about heaven of the heavens. The Bible doesn't tell us much about that. All we know about the heaven of the heavens, it's going to be glorious. But we get all these descriptions of this earthly kingdom, and we're going to see them today. All right, so Israel now then is given the prospect that when this kingdom comes in, and all the nations are going to be represented, they're all going to be starting on a population explosion right along with Israel, but that every Jew had the prospect of being a priest, not just the tribe of Levi, all of them. But they're going to have to meet God's conditions, see? So if they would be obedient, then God would bring in this glorious opportunity for every last Jew. All right? You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Now, you see, that's exactly the same words that Peter uses in his little epistle when he addressed the Jews of his day, that they were promised to be priests and a holy nation. That's not to us. Paul never, never does Paul call the grace age believer a priest. We're members of the body. We're ambassadors. And we are certainly the promoters of truth and all that. But we are never called priests in the body of Christ. All right. So every Jew in the prospect to be <coughs> a priest in this kingdom, a holy nation, these are the words which thou shalt speak. All right, now then let's jump all the way up to where the prophets now begin to lay out this earthly kingdom in all of its physical and political, if you want to use that word, the political attributes. Jump up with me to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. And as far as I can tell, this is the real first prophetic utterance unless David may possibly have it in the Psalms. But of the prophets, this is the first instance that we have this kingdom alluded to. Isaiah chapter 2. Might as well start verse 1. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now verse 2, it shall come to pass. Now, does time mean anything to our God? No. Nothing. He's timeless. And so even though Isaiah is writing 700 years before Christ, and this hasn't happened yet, don't you believe this stuff that everything ended in 70 A.D.? Uh, I, I can't get over Can you buy I just can't get over it. How in the world they can say this kind of stuff? But anyhow, this has not happened yet. Does that mean it isn't going to? Well, of course not. God is timeless. 
His wheels grind slowly. It's going to happen. Now we can see the evidence that we're getting closer and closer. I still like to go back to my old cartoon of the caveman, don't I, honey? Yeah, almost every once in a while I pull it on iron. You know, the old caveman was sitting in front of his door and he had a big sign over it, the end is near. And then he must have had a second thought and he put ER on the end of it. The end is nearer. <laughs> oh, okay, it's nearer now than it was two weeks ago when we were here. But it's getting closer and closer and closer. And again, you know, I'm always going back to that verse in Galatians. I did in the last taping. How did Paul refer to the birth of Christ at Bethlehem? That when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. What does that mean? God in his foreknowledge knew exactly what day Christ was going to be born. He knew the hour. But he doesn't necessarily reveal it. No, the same way here. God knows when this is going to come to pass. We don't. All we know is we're getting closer and closer. See? All right, back to the Isaiah, chapter 2. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain or the kingdom of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Now, remember the word mountain in the Old Testament ver uh, verbiage is a kingdom. All right, so this kingdom is going to be above all the other kingdoms of this world. It'll be exalted above even the smaller kingdoms. And now here's the part I want you to highlight or remember or do something with it. And all nations shall flow where? Into it. Now as we come up through the scriptures this afternoon, keep those words uppermost in your thinking that everything in that kingdom is going to flow into the capital city of that kingdom, which will be Jerusalem. All right? So all the nations shall flow into it. All right, now then let's just jump all the way up to uh, chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Now this is all we're going to do all afternoon, is just look at these uh, chronologically unfolding scriptures that are describing this coming kingdom that regardless of how you look at it has not happened yet, but it's going to. All right? Verse 6 and verse 7 of uh, Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6, for unto us a child is born, a reference to Bethlehem. A son is given, and the government. Now, do you want to call it political? <laughs> See, the only trouble is, in our understanding of Scripture, if it's political, it's bound to have what go with it? Corruption, yeah, absolutely, but not in this one. This is going to be a government that is as holy and righteous as God himself. So you can call it political, but leave the corruption aside. All right, so the increase or in the government shall be upon his shoulder, that is, this one who was born in Bethlehem. His name, when this kingdom comes in, shall be called Wonderful, Consular, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. In other words, it's going to slip right on into eternity. And it's going to be upon the throne of David. Now stop. Where was David's throne? In heaven? No. Jerusalem. And in particular, on what mountain? Mount Zion. See? Mount Zion. And that's where Christ is going to have his headquarters in this thousand-year kingdom, on Mount Zion, see? All right, upon the th oh, throne of David, where David's throne was in the past, and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with uh, justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. All right, now then, let's just go a little bit further to uh, Isaiah chapter 11. I'm just taking these as they unfold in Scripture. Now in Isaiah chapter 11, 
we look at another aspect of this glorious earthly kingdom. And I'm going to emphasize that word earthly all afternoon so that people get it out of their heads that we're talking about some kind of a spiritual invisible entity. No, we're talking about this planet that's going to be renovated and made new like the Garden of Eden. It's going to be beautiful beyond comprehension, but it also has all the other attributes of planet Earth, the animal kingdom. And that's what we see here in this chapter. Okay, Isaiah chapter 11, starting at verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now that's just Old Testament language, that out of the family tree, as we refer to it, here we have Jesse, out of Jesse came David, and then down through the hundreds of years of Israel's history came Jesus of Nazareth, the promised line of David and Solomon and so forth. All right, and the branch is a reference to Christ, will grow out of his roots. Now, verse 2, this is what's going to happen to the Christ, the Messiah, when he returns and sets up this kingdom on earth, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The sevenfold spirits of God, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. In other words, he's going to have all the attributes of the Godhead in his kingdom rule. All right, verse 3. And shall make of him quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge or rule now, we've gone over all this before. For a lot of you, I know this is review, but we've got a lot of listeners out there who have never heard this before. Believe me. He will not rule after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness, with all the righteousness now of the Godhead, remember, because that's who he is. He's God the Son. So with righteousness he shall rule the poor, Reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. In other words, the Beatitudes are going to become the constitution of this kingdom. He will smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. In other words, to prepare it for this kingdom economy. With the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. That's all past. That was done during the tribulation. Now back into the kingdom again. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Now we come to the animal kingdom. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the young lion and the fatling, all together. No, no controversy between these wild animals. No death, no tearing from limb and so forth. All right, and the fatling together. And in the midst of all that, what? Little children. Because these incoming people at the beginning of the millennium are going to be flesh and blood. They're going to be marrying and having families and having children. That's the whole idea of the kingdom. But there's no sin. There's no Satan. And so everything is going to be harmonious as Adam and Eve could have had it had they not eaten of the tree. Well, anyway, how can this happen? I always have to do this because otherwise people say, well, now this doesn't make sense. All right, come back to Genesis chapter 1. How can all these carnivorous animals, the lion, the wolf, and the tigers, and the leopards, how can they all be cohabiting with little children and with lambs and goats, which would ordinarily be their easiest prey? But here's the reason. Genesis 1, verse 30. Genesis 1, verse 30. And this is the way it's going to be again. See, now this is before Adam ate. This is before the curse fell. This is the way God originally created it. All right? Genesis 1, verse 30. To every beast of the earth, to every fowl of the air, to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Now what does that tell you? Everything. The carnivorous as we call them, the lions and the leopards and the goats and so forth are all going to eat of things that grow naturally. That's what we mean by the herbs. Nothing will kill something else for its diet. 
And that's why it's going to be so glorious, see? All right, so now then with that concept, since the curse will be lifted, Satan is locked up, yes, this becomes very believable, see? Back to Isaiah 11. And uh, now verse 7. The cow, the domesticated cattle, and the bears. That would never happen ordinarily, but it's going to because it's going to revert back to the pre-fall. And so the cow and the bear shall feed, that is, together. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion of all creatures, the lion shall eat straw or herbs or grass or forage, however you want to put it, just like cattle. The lion won't have to have meat for its diet. The lion's whole digestive tract will be changed again so that it'll be like it was before the fall where everything ate those things that grew naturally. All right, then verse 8, And the nursing child shall play on the hole of the, of the asp, a poisonous snake. And the wean child, see, we're showing that there are different stages of children, just like today. There's going to be infants and toddlers and older kids, and they're all part of this glorious kingdom economy now. And the weaned child shall put his hand on a cockatrice's den. And now verse 9. Here's the frosting on the cake, as we like to put it. They, all these inhabitants of this glorious earthly kingdom over which Christ is ruling and reigning, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. There will be no death no pain, no injury. It's going to be glorious. And yet they're going to be there in flesh and blood bodies. See that? All right, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Why? For the earth. See? Not heaven. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. In other words, everything is going to be as perfect as God can make it. Why can't people believe it? Does it stretch their imagination? My goodness, you know, if God could create the universe with all of its billions and billions and billions of stars and galaxies, you tell me that he can't make this possible? Why, this is nothing compared to what he's already done. And all he asks us to do is what? Believe it. That's why faith is the key. God wants us to believe what he says, and he's going to reward us accordingly. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.